It seems to me that uh, I'm doing a variation on the old theme of, uh, how can I best put it, uh, the fine art of reading. Except that I'm adding to that, Brendan, uh, a word. I'm talking today about the fine art of reading aloud. And what I've done so far in CDs has been uh, read aloud a sequence of poems, try to introduce some of those poems with very bare details. I don't want to undermine the poetry. I want people to hear the words, but I want to hear them in such a way that they will come alive. There are two ways, at least, of reading poetry. One is straightforwardly, straight on, and maybe not so attractive. The other way is to know those poems so well. Maybe you don't have them all memorized, but if you know them well, you get inside the language and the imagery you're able to communicate feeling in a way that's honest and direct. That's what I'm up to. It's as if we're sitting here uh, talking not just about reading poetry aloud, but talking about uh, rehearsing for a play. I mean, actors uh, can take the same part. Th the, the thousands of actors who have played Hamlet uh, and uh, reciters of poetry can have such a personal involvement in the emotion of the poem that it's going to come across as more immediate. I'm not saying it's going to violate the language, but uh, each man or woman reading a poem aloud is bringing to that poem age, experience, uh, love, uh, all of those things. I started doing it after the death of a beloved colleague, a colleague of yours and mine, uh, the late J. Robert Bath, former dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and uh, uh, at the same time, always uh, with a lot of the actor's instinct in him. And he did two or three of these, and after that, uh, he became uh, involved in administrative work and was not able to do as much, although whatever he did was done beautifully. Uh, uh, after Bob passed away to our sadness, I had a call from the director of the Burns Library. You are li you're a librarian, you know him as a colleague, Robert O'Neill. And Bob called me and simply without being unduly persuasive, said that he wondered if I'd like to continue the series that Bob had launched. And uh, I said I'd be delighted, I'd be honored, really. So strongly were my feelings about Bob as a human being, as a Jesuit, uh, as an administrator, and let's face it, as a writer about poetry, uh, books on Wordsworth, uh, fine books on Wordsworth. So I said yes, and Bob gave me complete freedom, complete freedom, that is, to work with poetry, but to, to pick the poets I wanted, although Bob is such a literary man, as you know, uh, he made excellent suggestions. After I had done a poetry based on a course that I had given some years ago called The Poetry of Religious Experience, after I had followed that with a CD uh, on the poetry of freedom in American literature, uh, Bob said, John, uh, you might think about sometime doing something on the poetry of Ireland. I said, well, Bob, you know, I'm not in Irish studies. I love uh, so many poets in that tradition. So I said, yes, I'm a gamer. Uh, I'm willing to take chances. And Brendan, I spent the better part of a summer reading Irish poetry. Uh, it was a fine time because I was working on a scholarly project of my own and then taking part of two or three afternoons a week to read aloud, to learn, and I did a CD on the poetry of Ireland. There was a very practical decision suggested early on by Bob O'Neill, who knew my course in the Romantics and 
knew that in that course I do poets like Blake, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Byron, Shelley, Keats. And he said, well, I, I'd, li I'd like you to pick the poems that you think are representative. If there's need for a second disc, we'll call it part two. And in a way, although not exactly, as you listen to that, and you and I listen to it together, uh, you see that the first part deals uh, with William Blake, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, William Wordsworth, uh, and John Keats. And who knows what the future will bring. I may then decide to go on and to do Shelley and De Quincey and what have you. But uh, that, that's the origin uh, of that new CD on the Romantics. Uh, I didn't want to downgrade the Romantics by hurrying along or by putting in too many poets. I wanted to pick poets that meant a lot to me and I'm sure would mean a lot to an audience. The way I dealt with it is interestingly revealed uh, not, not on a very large scale. Most of the poems that I've read aloud have been relatively manageable in size. But what do you do with a poet like Coleridge who wrote the rhyme of the ancient mariner? Or what do you do with even a poet, a poet like Wordsworth who wrote a, many, many short lyric poems and yet wrote one of the great autobiographical poems in the language, The Prelude? Uh, I found myself uh, on poets who wrote long poems using that marvelous gift uh, that all readers, all actors have, but readers of poetry especially, from. I move from this sonnet by Wordsworth to selections from the Ode on the Intimations of Immortality, and I would have picked out my three or four sections. So that the, my audience is hearing key sections of the poem, and yet they're not being overwhelmed for five, eight, 10, 12 more minutes. Even in this one, Brendan, uh, which is essentially poetry, uh, I thought it would be very interesting uh, to have my audience uh, either uh, in word or picture. Uh, I, want, I wanted my audience to have a, a real sense of what is a poem. What did the great philosophers say about poetry? And you may remember, or you will remember as you read along, that both Wordsworth and Coleridge wrote very interesting statements, in effect, defining poetry. And uh, several people who have heard the new CD have said to me, I was so happy to hear your brief introduction in which you cite Wordsworth's definition of a poet or of poetry. When I give, uh, especially my introductory course to the English major, uh, Studies in Poetry, or even when I give my core course in the core curriculum that's simply called Poetry and Drama, Needless to say, there are many opportunities for reading aloud. Uh, what I do on opening day of my class when I pass out my course outlines, my assignment sheet, uh, I remind students that all members of this class must, in the course of the semester, master a poem of 25 to 35 uh, lines in length. And Although it's a bit of a chore at first, when I read course evaluations, I hear I, I hear, I see students telling me how important it was for them to learn a poem, as we like to say, by heart. Uh, because then you are getting inside the language, inside the imagery. And now you have groups of students, say 35 students in a class, a class in which they are just being introduced to poetry, having as an assignment until their turn comes. It's always unfortunate for someone to be number one and have to be the first testing ground for a poem that she has memorized or he has memorized. But uh, 
I think when, it, when it's learned, when it's memorized, they feel as though somehow or other not only have they memorized words, they've gotten inside the rhythm of the poem, they've gotten inside the feeling of the poem, they know it better. I'm at heart and in practice a teacher. Uh, my audience at all levels, except maybe a graduate seminar where the agenda may be very different. But with freshmen being introduced to poetry and drama, some with no experience at all, some with limited experience, some with only their enthusiasm. With the course that opens the English major, Studies in Poetry, needless to say, uh, I do a fair amount of reading of poetry to an audience, but the audience is 25, 30. At the next level, which is the elective level, where classes can go up to 45 or 50, I have a different kind of audience. But I sense in your question, Brendan, an audience outside the classroom. And the answer is yes. Uh, I do a fair amount of reading to larger audiences. I do an annual reading up at Putnam House uh, for the Alumni Association. <clears throat> and there I would have, oh, 40, 45 uh, people in an audience. And it's a different kind of challenge, but I love it just as much. And people who have sat in front of a speaker standing at a podium reading aloud, but not quite getting the full meaning. What I try to do there is to know that I have a group much larger, loving poetry, but never having had the opportunity to work closely with it to learn what the rhythm of poetry actually means, to learn what a symbol is as against a simile, or what a metaphor is against this or that. So the answer to your question is I do a fair amount of reading aloud. On campus, uh, I've done, for example, I'm thinking in particular of a wonderful colleague of mine, I won't get into names, a colleague whom you know, whose wife is a pastoral associate at a local parish in the suburbs. And she asked me if I would come out and spend the evening not giving a lecture on theology and literature, but uh, giving a version of my CD, The Poetry of Religious Experience. And I've enjoyed that very much. And even there, you have to become just a bit of a teacher because someone in that audience is bound to say, what makes a poem religious? Why do you call this reading this evening the poetry of religious experience? And of course, I'm able to say there without having any great genius, well, I'll start with some readings from the Hebrew Bible, Bible maybe some of the Psalms, and I'll move from there uh, <coughs> into the poetry of, George, uh, of John Donne or George Herbert and they begin to come alive when they hear a poem like Herbert's Redemption or a lyric by John Donne. So uh, audience, yes. Uh, audience in the classroom, yes. Audience beyond the classroom, decidedly yes. Well, for the first time in my life, someone will say, uh, I've heard a poem for 12 minutes and uh, is there a difference between what you're doing this evening in Concord, Massachusetts and what you're doing at Chestnut Hill in a class of 25? And uh, I have to say that yes, I have to become a different kind of performer. The teacher is not, at least not strongly uh, oriented toward acting or toward uh, being so caught up in the emotion of the poem that the poem itself isn't as clear to the audience. Uh, I think we know that a great soliloquy can be done in two ways, in a Shakespeare play or in a modern play. Uh, but there's something about being able to do a poem in such a way
that the audience, for the first time in their lives in some question, how often do you hear, Professor, I've heard that poem since my high school days. Uh, I've heard that poem by Robert Frost. Uh, I know men of Achieve very well. Uh, but somehow or other, there must be in the teacher, there must be something in the reader of poetry, some gift that helps her or him get inside the speaker. And that's what I try to do. I try to somehow or other imagine the speaker, not as a mere performer, but as someone communicating, as I'll try to show in a few minutes when I pick a few of my, a few of my favorite poems for you to comment on. Some poems, because the emotion of the speaker in the poem, not the man in the, in the speaking to an audience, but in a Hamlet soliloquy, uh, oh, that this too, too solid flesh should melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Someone hearing that is hearing words, but is somehow or other getting inside this magnificent Shakespearean character. It's on a 29, but the number makes little difference. Let me just open my reading with Shakespeare's sonnet. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy content at least, yet in these thoughts myself almost despising, haply I think on thee, and then my state like to the lock at break of day arising, from sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate, for thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. I'd like to follow up on your request, if it's acceptable to you, by moving to another kind of poem uh, and another kind of poet. Uh, I want to go to an Irish poem, and it's a, an Irish poem that not many people know. So let me catch my breath and begin. I move from a Shakespeare poem that we call a sonnet, 17th century England. I take you to 20th century Ireland, and I take you to a poem by Seamus Heaney. Now, you may know a lot of Heaney poems, and people in the class or the audience may know a lot of Heaney poems, but I wonder if they know a poem called Midterm Break. I'd like to try that, Brendan. Seamus Heaney, born 1939, still with us. And here is his poem, Midterm Break. I sat all morning at the college sick bay, counting bells, knelling classes to a close. At two o'clock, the neighbors drove me home. In the porch, I met my father crying. He had always taken funerals in his stride and Big Jim Evans saying it was a hard blow. The baby cooed and laughed and rocked the pram when I came in, and I was embarrassed by old men standing up to shake my hand. 
and tell me they were sorry for my trouble. Whispers inform strangers I was the eldest. Away at school as my mother held my hand in hers and coughed out angry, tearless sighs. At 10 o'clock, the ambulance arrived with the corpse stanched and bandaged by nurses. Next morning, I went up into the room. Snowdrops and candles soothed the bedside. I saw him for the first time in six weeks, paler now, wearing a poppy bruise on his left temple. He lay in the four-foot box as in his cot. No gaudy scars. The bumper knocked him clean. A four-foot box, a foot for every year. So you go from Shakespeare to Seamus Heaney, each one demanding a, a different voice, a rather riv rhythmic voice in Shakespeare's sonnet. Shakespeare's sonnets are a certain length. They have a certain rhythm. With Heaney, you pick up the flavor of Ireland in the language and in my attempts to capture the flavor of the language. But you see what reading aloud is and how it can be a fine art with this woman or that man. It might be interesting in the light of some of the very interesting questions you've raised and statements you've made. <clears throat> I might, with your indulgence, read from William Wordsworth and read prose, not poetry. And the prose is all about what is a poet. I read from William Wordsworth and from his preface to the lyrical ballads. Taking up the subject then upon general grounds, let me ask what is meant by the word poet? What is a poet? To whom does he address himself? And what language is to be expected from him? He is a man speaking to men. A man, it is true, endowed with more lively sensibility, more enthusiasm and tenderness, who has a greater knowledge of human nature and a more comprehensive soul than are supposed to be common among mankind. A man pleased with his own passions and volitions and who rejoices more than other men in the spirit of life that is in him, delighting to contemplate similar volitions and passions as manifested in the goings-on of the universe and habitually impelled to create them where he does not find them. Composed upon Westminster Bridge, September 3, 1802. Earth has not anything to show more fair. Dull would he be of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty. This city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning. Silent, bare, ships, towers, domes, theaters, and temples lie open unto the fields and to the sky all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendor, valley, rock, or hill. Ne'er saw I, ne'er felt a calm so deep. The river glideth at his own sweet will. Dear God, the very houses seem asleep, and all that mighty heart is lying still. I take you now back to the early, the, really the late 18th, early 19th century, to some of Blake's songs of innocence and experience. I like to think, although I certainly claim no superior expertise, I like to think that when we're in high school, we hear these poems for the first time. When we move into college, <clears throat> 
and we begin to place Blake historically, we see him in a different light. We see him in the Lamb speaking, or should I say even singing, in the voice of a child. And then later, some four years later, we see The Tiger, a poem spoken with the voice and the emotions of an adult. In The Lamb, as we listen, we hear the world as seen through the eyes of a child. As we listen to The Tiger, we hear the world as spoken by the voice of a, of a morally indignant adult. I read those two poems now. William Blake, The Lamb. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life and bid thee feed by the streams and o'er the mead. Gave thee clothing of delight, softest clothing, woolly, bright. Gave thee such a tender voice, making all the vales rejoice. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee, little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name, for he calls himself a lamb. He is meek and he is mild. He became a little child. I a child and he a lamb. We are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. And by the same poet, William Blake, the tiger. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And what thy and when thy hand began to, I beg your pardon. And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Well, maybe I should try a little John Keats. Uh, certainly among the romantics, the youngest of the romantics, born 1795, died 1821. Uh, the subject of a, I guess I could say the subject of a movie uh, that came out maybe about a year ago called Bright Star. I may even have enough memory in me to close the reading of some of uh, Keats's poems with Bright Star. But I'll follow you, Brendan, and I will start with a poem I love dearly. I might as well be prejudiced up front. And it's called On First Looking Into Chapman's Homer. I begin. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told that deep-browed Homer ruled as his demean. Yet did I never breathe its pure serene 
till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortez when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. Well, why not try the Bright Star poem since those of us in the room may have seen that poem about a year ago. I begin, not quite yet, maybe with a bit of biographical information, that here's a poem written to the one woman that Keats really loved, Fanny Brown. John Keats, Bright Star. Bright star, would I was steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendor hunting, hanging aloft the night and watching with eternal lids apart like nature's patient, sleepless eremite, the moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution round earth's human shores, or gazing on the new soft-fallen mask of snow upon the mountains and the moors, no, yet still steadfast, still unchangeable, pillowed upon my fair love's ripening breast to feel forever its soft fall and swell, awake forever in a sweet unrest, still, still to hear her tender taken breath and so live ever or else swoon to death. It's said, and I underline, it is said, that Henry David Thoreau's Walden was inspired by Yeats's The Lake Isle of Innisfree. I read The Lake Isle of Innisfree. I will arise and go now and go to Innisfree and a small cabin built there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honey bee. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. Their midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore while I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's gray. I hear it in the deep heart's core. It seems to me that I want to do something with some of that marvelous 17th century English metaphysical poetry. I want to read some of John Donne's holy sonnets. I want, to read George, I want to read some of George Herbert's religious poetry. I want to read, I struck the board and cried no more. I want to read Redemption by George Herbert. Not that I'm going to use them as ways of teaching as ways of preaching sermons, but because I think both John Donne and George Herbert prove, at least to me, that you can, you, you can write a great religious poem without preaching. You can catch a religious moment in a symbol or in uh, an articulation of deep love of God. So those ideas are floating through my mind, to read some Herbert, to read some Dunn, to read some Crasher, Crashaw or Traherne, poems like that. And in the back of my mind, Brendan, since you put me on the spot, I'm wondering how people would feel, how audiences would feel, or how Bob O'Neill would feel about my doing selections from the Bible. <laughs>
certainly people in an audience or people sitting in their living room listening to a CD may be deeply stirred when they hear one of the Psalms or two of the Psalms read aloud. Or certainly uh, people in an audience interested in religious experience would be more than interested, would be engaged by hearing selections from John's Gospel. Those are some of the things floating through my mind. I love to read the Bible. And uh, there are on my first CD, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, selections from the Bible. I read from the Psalms. Uh, and it seems to me I could move into other religious traditions. The Quran, for example, is on my first CD. And uh, again, I would use it not as a vehicle for teaching the history of religion, but to allow my audience, my students, those sitting in front of me, to hear the voice of a religious poet coming close to those words of the Bible or to those words of the Quran or to those words of any great religious document. It seems to me they'd be engaged. The Bible would come alive. Too often we read the Bible almost as a, an exercise or not to be unfair. Too often we read it because we want to add it to our daily prayer so that there'll be enough prayer to satisfy the Lord. But no. Do you remember the episode? I, would, I yearn right now to read aloud from the Bible the episode of the young man coming to the Lord asking what must he do to be saved? And you know how that closes. Well, says the Lord, go sell all you have and give it to the poor. And the young man walked away sadly. What a moment that is, whatever one's belief is. 